thank you for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers and committee for giving me this opportunity to speak here and represent our recent work. This work is done in collaboration with my previous supervisor, Professor uh, Rudolf Kirbella and Professor Mahonyu, and in collaboration with Professor Renato Rena. Um, I'll give you start first some introductions and then the technical sketch and then show you the main result with a focus on quantum thermodynamical advantage and then give you the conclusion. Okay, uh, begin with the motivation. So information is encoded into patterns deviate from thermal fluctuations. So intuitively, and the more accurate um, information processing is, the more non-equilibrium resources it requires. So in this work, uh, we want to rigorously justify this in intuition, and we want to explicitly review the trade-off between the cost and the accuracy. Uh, our result also uh, reveals, want to reveal the quantum thermodynamic advantage for using quantum devices in certain tasks. Our result, based on many great works of the resource theoretic approach to thermodynamics in the past decade, and I'll give you a brief introduction. So quantum thermodynamics aims to extend classical thermodynamic notions like work heat to non-asymptotic quantum and nanoscale systems. Um, uh, here, uh, actually, quantum mechanics brings new features of thermodynamics, for example, um, for Landau's principle, you, you may have, have heard of it. Okay, can I use, no, laser? No. Oh, very, very weak. So, so if you encode one bit of information physically and you want to erase it, so it's as a compression of phase space. And Landau principle says that to accomplish this erasure, uh, no matter we begin with a zero or one, in the end we have a zero. If we implement this erasure, there has to be a work done, which is kb t ln to k, v is the Boltzmann constant, t is the temperature, and ln to is the factor. So um, in this scenario, you have to put work uh, in order to erase. However, like uh, Lydia uh, they show, and others, they show that if you have a quantum system that is entangled with the system as a quantum memory, and in this situation, you can erase the system and while keeping the memory intact and simultaneously it can extract KBT learn to work instead of uh, paying the, the work KT learn to. So uh, another motivation for studying quantum thermodynamics is for nano devices. In conventional thermodynamics, the free energy is actually an average quantity. Uh, which is given by von Neumann entropy, right? So uh, and this is in the R&D limit. But however, with nowadays we have computing devices, uh, manufacturers in nanoscale, they are very small. They are way away from the R&D uh, limit. So these are non-asymptotic regimes. And this motivates the study of non-asymptotic thermodynamics to, that involves like finite short of experiments and uh, um, strongly correlated systems. Uh, in 2011, Oscar, Dustin, and others pointed out that it's, it's inadequate to use just the normal entropy to characterize extractable work. Uh, this actually induced a uh, Master shift to use non asymptotic entropy, such as min max entropy, to study thermodynamics. Uh, the idea is quite neat, I'm just explained to you. Consider you have a worker, and uh, his job is to lift the box from the ground to the table. But half of the time, the worker just threw the box too high, and half of the time, the worker just drops the box too low. But on average, you will see that they coincide with the requirement. But definitely, this is not something we want the worker to do. So how should we characterize his, his performance? Um, this, then we, we use the notion of like the main work and max work for say, for example, the main work uh, uh, epsilon means with, uh, except with probability epsilon, the work cost is at least this much. So this, uh, in fact, uh, gives us a more accurate characterization for this fluctuation 
scenario. This is important because uh, you do not want to your chip burn. Uh, so even if on average the heat dissipation is small, but uh, it fluctuates a lot, then the chip will burn. Okay, and there are many great works done in this direction, and I'm listing here several key papers that you can see here. Like in the beginning, it's just the reset with quantum memory, and then it comes to state transitions, and it, uh, all the way comes to, to transitions with catalysts and then to quantum channels, to CPTD maps, right? So you can see this trend to, to, to from just state transitions to um, quantum channels, and here we actually we take one step further. We go from channels to general task. Um, what do we mean by that? Like for quantum channel, you have a process with a row input, you have an output. So it's an input output realization, but it has further structures. So for CPT map, it has to be a linear map, uh, which is complete positive and pre trace preserving. Here we generalize this uh, CPTV map to general task. We drop any other mathematical structures. We just uh, assign a desired relation between input and output without any other constraint. And why we do this? Because first, one task can be achieved by many channels. So given by a calculation, there are many ways to do this calculation. Um, the secondly, certain tasks cannot be modeled by CPTV maps because quantum mechanics forbids you to do it. Uh, for example, we consider quantum cloning. Perfect quantum cloning is impossible. So that means there's no CPTP map that can model this task of quantum cloning. But still, you can define an input-output table by assigning uh, all the transitions between the pure states. Okay, so this generalizes from uh, channels to general tasks. Then let's uh, see the technical sketch of work on how we derive the uh, optimal trade-off between non-equilibrium cost and accuracy. So our goal is to find the non-equilibrium cost uh, to accurate information processing. For this, and we have to address three questions. First, how to model the information task, and then how to evaluate the accuracy of a realistic machine. And finally, how to quantify the non-equilibrium cost of the machine. So let's begin with information processing task. As I mentioned earlier, it's just uh, a desired input-output relation. For, for example, for classical operation like the AND gate, uh, you can specify this operation by this uh, binary table. Uh, similarly, for quantum uh, uh, task, we can specify the input state and output states. And it's not just for one state transformation, it's for all, so if you have a label that labels all possible state transitions that is required for accomplishing the task. Uh, for example, this is the task for concluding. You have n copies of unknown pure state. You generate additional that n copies. And as I mentioned earlier, this definition actually goes beyond quantum channel. Now, in the end of the day, you have to implement the task on a real machine. And this word is quantum mechanical, so the real machine that implements the task uh, obeys uh, uh, quantum mechanics, so it's a uh, CPTV map, so it's a quantum channel, so this real machine is, let's call it an M, will generate the real uh, op output, right? But our desired task is an ideal task, is output real X prime, so we should ask how similar are them. Um, then what we do is we design operational task of uh, quantifying the performance of the real machine. So we measure observables, we call it performance test. For any uh, given input state, we can define an uh, associate observable. Um, and then we measure it, the expectation value will tell us the performance. In the extreme case, let's consider OX is a projector. For example, if you have uh, input state to a pure state, then OX is just a projector on the pure state. And in this case, it's just the fidelity. And this corresponds to worst case fidelity. But in general, we can design uh, a, a arbitrary observable for doing this. Now let's consider how to quantify the thermodynamic cost, the non-equilibrium cost of our machine. So we call it non-equilibrium cost because essentially we want to characterize how many non-equilibrium state is used in the process. And the framework we use is called resource theoretic, uh, resource theory of uh, 
uh, Gibbs preserving maps I'll tell you about. So in this research theory, the free states, the states that are free of cost is Gibbs states at temperature T. We call it gamma. And uh, why we choose it? Because it's the only complete passive state. So no matter how many copies of the states you're given, you cannot extract work from it. This is only Gibbs, uh, this is the only passive state, complete passive state. Um, for free operations, we consider Gibbs preserving maps that sends Gibbs state to Gibbs state. Why we choose this? Because this is the most general operations. For otherwise, if you map Gibbs state to non Gibbs states, then you can use the free states and free operation many times to generate many copies of non Gibbs states. And from that, you can extract work and the whole framework just collapse. So, with this, you can see that this is actually the most general. Uh, framework you can have for some dynamics to hold. And that implies if uh, whatever bound you derive in this framework should, in, should be valid in other uh, frameworks. So that's a good thing with this uh, generality. Uh, how to count the non equilibrium cost? Uh, so we use a kind of uh, equivalence between information and energy. This is established by this. Like, uh, you can, uh, you can use KTLPT loading to work to erase uh, something. Uh, you can use, uh, if you have information about something, you can use what we saw is called CLAD engine to extract work. So this is kind of equivalence. Uh, this idea is originates to back to 1980 by Charlie Burnett. Uh, he uh, invented the notion of information fuel tip. And in 2015, Fist and Renner and others, they, uh, generalize this idea to information battery. This is actually a battery is many two level uh, degenerate qubits in it. Uh, some of them are pure states. Okay, I use green to, de de to, to denote the pure states. After some process, the, the, the battery will be used and the, the this that is used is the pure state will be dissipated into mixed state, maximum mixed state. And you just compare how many pure states is dissipated in this process, and that number of pure qubits will be considered as the non equilibrium cost. Okay, so this is a whole technical framework. And uh, to summarize, we just uh, uh, use this framework to, to, to put our problem into optimization problem. So it's actually a semi definite programming. So we would like to find the minimal cost over all possible Gibbs preserving maps over all possible battery sizes such that the machine operates when it's on input A to output B, it achieves the task with, at, with performance at least F. So it's a, mini, a big optimization problem. And we derive bound from this optimization, and this is our main result. So solving this STPV is actually a fundamental bound. Uh, the non group cost, we call it CI, C, and F means that to achieve the accuracy with at least F, this is the non equilibrium cost in terms of Q qubits uh, dissipated in the battery, right? So it's larger than or equal to a kappa plus logarithm of F. Logarithm F is very easy. It's just the logarithm of the accuracy. And uh, kappa is what we call it reverse entropy. It's complicated, but I will explain to you. So kappa uh, is it depends only on the task, but not any specific implementation. And this bound actually valid for arbitrary implementation. So given any machine M that has accuracy F, it must, have, uh, it must satisfy this bound. This reverse entropy is given by the main conditional uh, uh, entropy. And why we call it reverse entropy is because it relates to the reverse task um, to see this, let's consider a simple example. Consider the degenerate case, like uh, all the uh, Hamiltonian is chosen to be zero, and for simplicity, let's consider the dimension of the input and output system as both D. So this makes our Gibbs state a uh, maximum state. And uh, to d consider the direct task. With every direct task, we can also define a reverse task. Reverse task is just to swap these two, right? So have the output become the input, and the input becomes the output. And uh, the accuracy test uh, can be given, let's say, just choose this rho x prime and the observer. So then you can define the accuracy of the forward process and accuracy of the fo reverse process. 
and define the maximal value of the reverse process achieved by some quantum channel uh, as F reverse max. This reverse entropy is just the ne negative logarithm of this quantity. So this bound actually connects both the forward direction and reverse direction, and that's what, why we call it reverse entropy. And a simple example is like Landau erasure. The direct, direct task is uh, reset, right? But the reverse task is to summarize from zero to uh, half identity. And the similarity test uh, uh, for the direct task is projector, and uh, for other one is just ignorance. You, you, you don't care about the results. And, and the accuracy you can have uh, here is like this one. This one actually you get a uh, highest value one half, and you substitute it, you get the reverse entropy as one. Substitute into a bound, you get a generalized Landau principle for imperfect erasure. So you do not require perfect accuracy f equals to one. And when it's equals to one, it reduces to the KBT law and two bound. But if when it's smaller than one, you see it's uh, inaccurate uh, reset, bit reset, then uh, it's smaller. So this is a modification for imperfect re re erasure. Our, our result also um, can be reformulated into uh, the accuracy you can achieve uh, when the non-equilibrium resources at hand is limited. So there are a lot of regions. And uh, we also pre-prove uh, tools to, to check the, the, the tightness or bounds. So we prove that actually you, you have the only point you have to check tightness is the maximum or, or the optimal machine with maximal accuracy possible. And we prove the bound. Uh, if, we, if you prove that our bound is tight at this point, then it's automatically tight for the maximally possible region. And uh, all the machines here is a mixture. Optimal machines is a mixture of the best machine and the fixed output machine. You combine them, you saturate bound. And we also consider like uh, how our results reduce to ID limits. So we take the first smooth and take the, uh, the, the, the limit to the, the thermodynamic limit and reduce to back to known results, uh, which is nice. Uh, our results can also be used to compare uh, coherent and incoherent machines and uh, prove, therefore, uh, review the quantum thermodynamic advantage. So consider you have a quantum input, quantum output. So in between, you can have a quantum, uh, real quantum uh, machine, or you have a classical simulation. You measure first the uh, state, and you do some calculation based on the result, you can prepare another quantum state. So this one is incoherent, right? It's entangled breaking. And the question naturally to ask is, does incoherent processing cost more energy? And uh, for this incoherent information processing, we also have this uh, uh, bound, not only the original bound, but it's the most stringent bound. It also satisfies uh, larger than equal to kappa star, which is the reverse entropy of the transposed task. Uh, you have Rx to Rx prime, you transpose Rx prime is the basis of uh, uh, energy eigen basis. With this, we can establish quantum thermodynamic advantage, and I'm gonna give you an example. So here you have an input of a quantum colony, n copies of a pure states, unknown. And output, you want to have uh, that n additional copies. And there are two ways to do it. One is optimal universal colony, the other is a measure and prepare uh, with by, by estimation. And with this, we actually calculate the bound of Kappa star and Kappa clone uh, without star, okay? So we prove analytically that it's strictly larger, uh, kappa clone star is strictly larger than kappa clone, and this means that the incoherent cloner uh, costs more energy or more non-equilibrium resources at a, uh, a given fidelity. Or because in this case, it's uh, pure state at all, it's just fidelity. So consider like this uh, figure summarize our result. So you can see that the, the yellow region is a region you, uh, achieved by the measure and prepare incoherent strategy. The blue region is by universal quantum cloner or other coherent strategy. And you can see this star, this one uh, cannot be achieved by any uh, measure and prepare incoherent strategy. And uh, this is interesting because if you consider just the fidelity, this one can also be achieved by measure prepared channels. 
but if you consider the dimension also also consider the dimension of non equilibrium cost, this can never be achieved by a, quant a, a classical simulation. So this actually established the quantum advantage of using quantum devices in this quantum cloning task. With this, we come to our, let's say, conclusion. Uh, in this work, we have a fundamental uh, bound or fundamental trade-off revealed between the non equilibrium cost and accuracy of general information processing tasks, which looks like this, right? This bound is actually we prove is tied for many classes uh, of information tasks, and uh, we also show that it reduced to standard thermodynamics uh, results in the RID limit. And uh, with this bound, we also invented the notion of reverse entropy, uh, which depends only the task, but not the implementation. And uh, this reverse entropy also uh, connects the reverse uh, task. And uh, certainly, we proved a quantum uh, advantage uh, in using coherent devices. And they are generally more efficient. An example is quantum cloning. Conceptually, we have some uh, advances added to the direction. First is that we generalize from channel to arbitrary task. So, and this, this method, this uh, kind of methodology can be, let's say, generalized not to not only this uh, resource series some dynamic uh, approach uh, direction, but also other research field. And finally, it's, uh, we have shown with this bound is accuracy, uh, the accuracy cost trade-off is explicit, so everything is here looks nice. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, you can drop me an email. Thank you. OK, so thank you, Meng Fei, for the nice talk. So any questions? Yeah, I have actually have two questions. Uh, for first, I I'm not very well understand what is uh, do you mean by quantum cloning in the non-equilibrium region? Like why when you have some non-equilibrium resource that you can do this quantum cloning? Okay, so to address your first first question, let's see, see here. It's like here you want to generate additional copies of the state, right? The simple idea to have non-equilibrium cost is that you at least, let's say the perfect case, you at least have additional dead and pure states because the input state is pure. If you can accomplish task perfectly, you would have that an additional pure state. And pure state is away from some equilibrium. Some equilibrium is gap state. So you have at least to supply this amount of uh, non-equilibrium resources to store the information. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's basically when you go to the printer shop, uh, printing shop, uh, you want to print some document, you have to some black register, black uh, paper uh, to store the printed file. So that's one reason uh, that you have this uh, uh, non-equilibrium cost. The other is because if you consider non-degenerate, um, uh, systems, if you want to, let's say, flip the energy levels, or you can want to create a fr transition from the ground state to the highest excited state, that costs energy. And that amount of energy can be uh, transformed by, uh, I show you earlier, that this one, uh, this amount of energy can be transformed by the information, which is cubes, pure qubits. So that's the two reasons. Uh, so I want to know, like, uh, even even if you have re this results, uh, I think quantum mechanics do not allow you to do perfect yes. uh, cloning. Yes. But uh, so in your results, I've actually they, they cannot be very close to one in any cases. Yes, yes, we do not, we cannot uh, achieve this. So you will see that if you apply quantum cloning to here, the so, uh, let's see directly the the plot. Okay, you see here this. Uh, Plateau. This uh, uh, this cutoff is because no current theorem, oh, so yeah, you yeah. cannot achieve perfect. 
Okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so yeah. if you consider this scenario, there are two constraints. First is the physical constraint of linearity of quantum mechanics, not clean zero. You can't go above into the region three. But region one is below the threshold. It's, you can't achieve higher in region one simply because you don't have sufficient non-equilibrium. So that's the new aspects we, re we reviewed. Uh, yes, thanks for the reply. And another question is, uh, uh, so, so uh, can you further explain why when you have a, like a reverse entropy in the, in, in the bound, in the mirror result, the upper bound, uh, um, the lower bound, so yeah. Is there any physical intuition to have this reverse entropy term? Well, uh, for movement, is, this to me is a very nice symmetrical mathematical result. But the physical intuition, I, I cannot give you here. Like we, sh we can investigate later, but now I do not have. OK, so more questions. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, tightness of the, this equality. Like, uh, uh, the, is this equality Inequality has uh, its achieve like um, the right hand uh, is it achievable or like uh, the equality uh, achievable? Uh, okay, let's say this: it's achievable mm -hmm. by a bunch of tasks, but mm -hmm. it's not always achievable. There, are, there are examples that uh, is that this bound is not tight. Mm -hmm. But it's, let's say our conclusion we show in our paper that this bound, uh, including this one, right? So our bound uh, is uh, is tight. Is tight, accurate height for uh, for all the uh, classical deterministic computation and their quantum extensions, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say it's also like, for example, it's tight for quantum colonia, it's tight for universal transportation, etc. Um, so that's the tightness. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, can you construct the explicit uh, protocol actually? Yes. Yes. And uh, for example, for universal quantum colonia. You can just uh, use this one. The, use this one as optimal machine. We also prove that this optimal, Werner's optimal universal cloner, if you, you, you Google this, uh, see, it's not only, uh, as we used to say, that it's not only uh, highest fidelity, but it's also saturated by bound. So it means that uh, this cloner um, is also, let's say, it's also optimal in the energy trade-off. Mm -hmm. ah, that's very okay. interesting, thank you. Yes, thank you. So there's a time for one more question. <clears throat> okay, so if no more questions, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>